let's take a closer look at some of these uh, shifting dynamics. I'm joined in the studio by Joshua Walker. He's a transatlantic fellow with the German Marshall Fund. Joshua, welcome to the program. Before I get to Afghanistan, I want to ask just a, basically a general question about this NATO um, defense minister meeting going on. What do you think NATO allies and these defense ministers want to hear from Jim Mattis, the U.S. Defense Secretary. I think the number one thing they want to hear is reassurance. I think there was some consternation that President Trump chose not to talk about Article 5 explicitly, which is different than most administrations. There have been many levels of reassurance issued by the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State since then. But now we're having a real conversation about what this means on the ground, the level of spending, what it means for troops levels on Afghanistan. I think the NATO allies are saying, look, we're going to do our share and we're going to bring our proposal to you. But is the United States going to continue down the policy path we've been used to since World War II. After a rough start on some pretty controversial comments and tweets by President Trump, like saying NATO is obsolete, do you feel this transatlantic alliance presently is strong? The issue with the transatlantic relationship is any one moment snapshot, it's easy to kind of figure out holes in the relationship. You could point to specific tweets and things as you've talked about. I think on the whole it is strong, but it doesn't mean that because it's strong it doesn't need nurturing. And I think particularly as we celebrate the 70 years uh, since World War II, as we think about the Marshall Plan, all these things that were put in place proactively, how does the United States continue to cultivate that relationship even as the globe changes and maybe Europe is no longer at the center of many of those areas? As far as discussions on the table, how much do you believe um, Russia or North Korea, DPRK, I should say, how much will that dominate the discussions? These are defense ministers. Absolutely. I mean, as a defense minister of any of these major countries, you have to think about all those issues. But I think geographically speaking, obviously, as the report has already highlighted, cybersecurity, Russia and Afghanistan are going to dominate. North Korea uh, tends to be an area where maybe China and Russia and those countries are more involved than NATO. And the United States, as a NATO member, obviously brings that to sure. the table. But given the way this administration tends to look at the world, there is a more of a transactional nature going on between the transatlantic and the transpacific space. So let me ask you about Afghanistan. There seems to be an agreement of sending uh, increasing troop numbers there, not in a combat role. Um, this war, the troop presence, has been going on for 16, 17 years now. Is this what Afghanistan needs to fight the Taliban insurgency, to bring some stability to this country? Is this the answer? Unfortunately, we've been struggling with this for the last decade, it seems. And the question every time is, can we throw troops at this? Will this fix the problem? There's more than just a military solution. There needs to be a political solution. But it seems no matter what the political rhetoric coming out of any capital, including Washington, we all end, back, in, end up where we started. And, and President Trump, as you've already highlighted, made some statements that were different than his predecessors. When it comes to this request, it seems like we're following the norm in the past. And I think in some ways, we, we, we don't have much other option at this point in time. We have to work with our Afghan partners. We have to figure out a way to work with a coalition to be able to kind of, you know, kind of finish what we started. We're still a long way away from where we need to be, but I don't see any other option at this point in time. And finally, let me ask you about uh, NATO allies apparently have agreed to increase defense funding by 4.3 percent. And as you know, Trump had criticized this was a sore issue. Is he going to take credit? And is this a victory for him? Because he had said they need to contribute more. I mean, certainly from the headlines we're seeing, the 4.3 percent increase that is directly going to be, uh, you know, giving to the United States president an opportunity to say, I demanded it and I got it. And see, look, I wasn't actually saying that NATO was obsolete. That's a that's kind of the art of the deal here, making the negotiation. I think you're going to see a lot of these headlines. The question is going to be, in the long run, does the increased spending that we've seen from our NATO allies, is it aligned with U.S. global strategy? Or are we able to work more in terms of, you know, being able to be interoperable here? That's something that it's going to time will tell. And is this going to be a long long-term significant increase, or if the Americans don't live up to their set of expectations, will the Europeans say, why do we increase our spending? And are there differences in terms of kind of focus, where the Europeans say, look, we want to focus exclusively on our region of the world, what's happening in Ukraine, what's going on with Russia? And the Americans say, well, we want to focus on other areas in terms of ISIS and DPRK, and we need you to hold down the fort here, so we're going to draw down our own troop levels in Europe or other areas. Joshua Walker, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.